Welcome to a new Word Power episode from English Plus Podcast. This is your host, Danny, and today we're going to talk about peaks and politics. Now, you might think that it has to do with peaks between nations and stuff. No, no, we're talking about mountains. But remember, it's peaks and politics. Now, before we start, let me tell you about the words we're going to learn in the context of today's story. We're going to learn the words aloof, revel, strife, annex, retrospect, defile, tumult, altruism, vilification, and exploit. So, if you're interested, join me in this episode. We're going to talk about peaks and politics, and we're going to discuss these 10 words in context. Welcome to a new Word Power episode from English Plus Podcast. Now, before we start, let me remind you that you can practice everything we're going to learn in this episode. You can practice it in two different ways. There's a link in the description of this episode that will take you to my website, EnglishPlusPodcast.com, to the custom post I created for this episode where you can practice in two different ways. There are interactive activities that you can do on the website if you are a fan of digital activities. And these are really good activities that will help you add these words to your permanent vocabulary bank, so don't miss out on those. And if you're a fan of pen and paper, I got you covered. There's also a PDF practice worksheet that you can download and practice to your heart's content. There are fun exercises like crossword puzzles, word searches, and others, but that's not everything. In the PDF, you also get the chance to practice the previous four Word Power episodes. So if you've been following the series for some time, you know that this will be very interesting, remembering those words we learned in the previous four Word Power episodes. And now, without further ado, let's start with today's topic. And remember, it is about peaks and politics. That's coming next. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Rising straight up from the valley floor, the Tetan Mountains thrust into the sky like huge spears. On some days, the snow-tipped peaks seem close enough to touch. On others, they appear aloof and unapproachable, smothered by clouds. Most visitors to Wyoming who revel in the mountain's beauty probably don't know that this small corner of the world was once the setting for political upheaval. It took more than 50 years to resolve the strife among conservationists, big game hunters, dude ranchers, cattle barons, lumber companies, and politicians. The first attempt to turn the Tetons into a national park took place in 1898, when the suggestion was made to annex it to nearby Yellowstone Park. Cattle ranch owners, fearing the loss of valuable grazing land, defeated the proposal. After World War I, the price of beef plunged and cattle breeders needed a new way to make a living. One result was dude ranches that lured Easterners to the Romantic West where they could play at being cowboys. In retrospect, the dude ranches sound like an American version of the African big game hunt. Hunters flocked to the area, clamoring for the opportunity to be photographed with their kills of elk, moose, buffalo, or bear. It wasn't long before hot dog stands, cheap motels, and souvenir shops defiled the beauty of the area. With the hope of rescuing the Tetons, Horace Albright, superintendent of Yellowstone, escorted industrialist John D. Rockefeller Jr. on a trip through the mountains in 1926. Since Rockefeller's very name would have increased land prices beyond realistic levels, Albright suggested that Rockefeller form a secret company to purchase land in the area. When it was learned that Rockefeller had bought much of the Valley of Jackson Hole to deed it to the nation for a national park, however, tumult resulted. The mountains, lakes, and a very small section of the valley were made into the first Grand Teton National Park in 1929. But Rockefeller's gift of more than 33,000 acres much of the rest of the valley was refused. His act of pure altruism was interpreted as an invasive attempt to cheat poor homesteaders. Actually, the vilification of Rockefeller came mostly from the cattlemen who were afraid that the park service would not allow them free access to the valley grazing lands. The line was 
and still is drawn between conservation and exploitation. In 1942, Rockefeller informed President Franklin D. Roosevelt that if the National Park Service would not take over the land, he was going to sell it. When Roosevelt accepted the gift by executive privilege, Congress passed a law to stop it, which the president in turn vetoed. Another eight years passed before all the land that Rockefeller had bought, plus the earlier National Park, was turned into the Grand Teton National Park. So, peaks and politics. Now you get the meaning of this title, this interesting title. Maybe you know about the place, maybe you don't know. Maybe you know about the history of this place, maybe you don't. I hope you learned something new today. And of course, now we're going to shift our attention to the 10 words we're going to discuss in the context of today's episode. Let me remind you again, these words are aloof, revel, strife, annex, retrospect, defile, tumult, altruism, vilification, and exploit. We're going to start with the very first word next, so don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Now let's start with the very first word, aloof. A-L-O-O-F. Let me remind you with how we use this word in context. We said on some days, the snow tip peaks seem close enough to touch. On others, they appear aloof and unapproachable smothered by clouds. So, in this context, which word could best replace aloof? Which one do you think? Could we replace it with inviting, remote, narrow, or tough? Which one is it? Think about it, and I'll be right back with the answer. Now, for those of you who thought remote is the right answer, you're absolutely right. Now, we can use that for places, we can use it for people as well. Someone who is aloof is not very friendly and does not like to spend time with other people. And of course, here it doesn't apply to a mountain or the peak of a mountain, but it's the same thing, a distant person, a distant thing. So we're talking about remote when we talk about places, obviously, we're talking about remote places. And here in the context, we were using it a little bit figuratively speaking. We said on some days it seemed that you can touch these peaks, but on other days they seem aloof, remote, unapproachable, because they're obviously smothered by clouds. So this is the word aloof. Remember, we can use it for things, for places, like we used it in the context, or we can use it for people as well, for people who are not very friendly and do not like to spend time with other people. All right, that was our first word. Now let's move on and talk about the next word, revel. R-E-V-E-L, revel. Now let me remind you how we use this word in context. We said most visitors to Wyoming who revel in the mountain's beauty probably don't know that this small corner of the world was once the setting for political upheaval. Problems, obviously. But our word is not upheaval. Our word is revel, R-E-V-E-L. Now, my question is, which word or words, obviously, could best replace revel in this context? Could we replace revel with make a demand, shelter or protect, dedicate ceremonially, or take great pleasure? So, which one is it? Think about it, and I'll be right back with the answer. Now, for those of you who thought take great pleasure is the best answer, you're absolutely right, because it is. If you revel in a situation or experience, you enjoy it very much. It's like a celebration. It's like you live it up or something like that. So people who revel in the mountain's beauty, they enjoy it greatly. They take great pleasure. That's the meaning of the word, revel. And that's not our last word. Obviously, we still have the next word and the one after and the ones after. But let's stick to the next one, and that is strife. S-T-R-I-F-E, strife. How do we use that word in context? We said it took more than 50 years to resolve the strife among conservationists, big game hunters, dude ranchers, cattle barons, lumber companies, and politicians. So we're talking maybe about something that has to do with problems, maybe, I don't know. That's up to you, because that's my question now. Strife can be best explained as what? Can it be explained as bitter conflict, several authoritative sources, courteous behavior, or unusual perspectiveness? Which one is it? Think about it, and I'll be right back with the answer. (laughs) 
Now, for those of you who thought bitter conflict is the right answer, you're absolutely right, because strife is strong disagreement or fighting or obviously conflict. It could even lead to battle, a struggle, etc. That is the meaning of strife. Now, let's move on to the next word, annex. A-N-N-E-X. How do we use that word in context? We said the first attempt to turn the Tetons into a national park took place in 1898 when the suggestion was made to annex it to nearby Yellowstone Park. So this is the context. My question is, which words could best replace annex in this context? Could we replace annex with become confusing, with add to something, with pressure by force, or with serve as a substitute. So, which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back with the answer. Now, for those of you who thought add to something is the right answer, you're absolutely right. Well, we use that when we want to talk about countries usually, but it could be used for just lands or counties or etc. But if a country annexes another country or an area of land, It seizes it and takes control of it. So it's like taking over or acquiring, seizing. Sometimes it happens by force and sometimes it happens after some agreement of sorts. But anyway, we don't care if it happens by force or if it happens after some agreement. The word itself, annex, means adding a place to another place or maybe to a country or something. So that's our word, annex. Now the next word is retrospect. R-E-T-R-O-S-P-E-C-T, retrospect. Let's see how we use that in context. We said, one result was dude ranches that lured Easterners to the Romantic West, where they could play at being cowboys. In retrospect, the dude ranches sound like an American version of the African big game hunt. So, in retrospect, that's the word, that's the context. Now, which word or words could best replace retrospect in this context? Could we replace it with complication, clash of opinions or ideas, review of the past, or random? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back. Now, for those of you who thought review of the past is the best answer, you're absolutely right. When you consider something in retrospect, and by the way, we usually use it with in, in retrospect. Anyway, when you consider something in retrospect, you think about it afterwards and often have a different opinion about it from the one that you had at the time. So it's like when you contemplate some decisions you made. And at the time, you thought it was the best decision, but in retrospect today, I look back on that thing and I believe that I made the wrong decision. It's not about regretting something, it's just about looking back on something. And usually, as I said, when you use this expression, you mean that you have a different opinion about it now than the one you had at the time. And now let's move on to the next word, defile, D-E-F-I-L-E. Let's see how we use that word in context. We said it wasn't long before hot dog stands, cheap motels, and souvenir shops defiled the beauty of the area. And unfortunately, that's a common thing. Wherever there's an attraction of sorts, these things happen to arrive there before anybody else. I have absolutely no idea how it happens. I don't know. But you just go there and you find them there already defiling the beauty of the area. Because that's usually not the reason why you decided to go see that place. Anyway, let's focus on the word defile. Now, we use this word in this context. Which word or words could best replace defiled in this context? Could we replace it with corrupted, declared under oath, rejected, or enhanced? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back. Now, for those of you who thought corrupted is the right answer, you're absolutely right. To defile something that people think is important or holy means to do something to it or say something about it which is offensive. To make it foul, dirty, to pollute it. That's the meaning of defile. To corrupt the place. And that's exactly what hot dog stands. Don't get me wrong, I like hot dogs, I like cheap motels and souvenir shops, but they're not supposed to be just everywhere. 
I mean, some places should be kept as they are. And at least if you want to throw a couple of hot dog stands, cheap motels and souvenir shops, not just right there. I mean, you could keep them a little bit at a distance. Let people enjoy the place. And of course, on their way back, they can buy a souvenir or something. But anyway, that was about the word defile. Let's move on to the next word, tumult. T-U-M-U-L-T. Tumult. How do we use that word in context? We said when it was learned that Rockefeller had bought much of the Valley of Jackson Hall to deed it to the nation for a national park, however, tumult resulted. So when we talk about tumult in this context, what do we mean? Do you think it means choice and use of words? Do you think it means a mournful cry, a structure that encloses, or disorderly commotion? So which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back. Now, for those of you who thought disorderly commotion is the right answer, you're absolutely right, because a tumult is a state of great confusion or excitement. Now, usually it's not a positive word. I mean, like 99% of the times you're talking about something bad, you're talking about disturbance, trouble, chaos, turmoil, something bad. Now here, the tumult that happened just because Rockefeller tried to give this piece of land to the nation for a national park. Now, of course, they started vilifying the man for doing that, but it was not because they had any evidence of bad intention or anything, but they were afraid of losing their interests in this land. But before we get to that, let's talk about another word that has to do with Rockefeller himself. And this word is altruism. A-L-T-R-U-I-S-M. Now, let's see how we use that in context. We said Rockefeller's gift of more than 33,000 acres, much of the rest of the valley, was refused. His act of pure altruism was interpreted as an invasive attempt to cheat poor homesteaders. So that was the word altruism in context. Now, my question to you is, how can we best explain altruism in this context? Can we explain it as a concealed imperfection? unselfish concern for the welfare of others, a sudden intense display of light, or the point at which significant action occurs. Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back. Now, for those of you who thought unselfish concern for the welfare of others is the right answer, you're absolutely right. It's like saying selflessness, charity, consideration, or goodwill. That's the meaning of altruism. The unselfish concern for other people's happiness and welfare. And now let's move on to the next word. Now, of course, cattlemen didn't like it because they were afraid they would lose those grazing grounds for their cattle. So they vilified the man. And the word here is vilification. V-I-L-I-F-I-C-A. T-I-O-N, vilification, which comes from the verb vilify. But let's see how we use that in context. We said, actually, the vilification of Rockefeller came mostly from the cattlemen who were afraid that the park service would not allow them free access to the valley grazing lands. The line was and still is drawn between conservation and exploitation. So that is our word. Now, which word could best replace vilification in this context? Could we replace it with denial of membership, the condition of having been broken, the act of making vicious and damaging statements about somebody, or an inappropriate or unwelcome addition? Which one do you think is the answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back. Now, for those of you who thought that the act of making vicious and damaging statements about somebody is the right answer, you're absolutely right. The vilification of somebody happens when you say or write very unpleasant things about that person so people will have a low opinion of this person, him or her. That's the meaning of vilification. Well, they tried and it worked for some time, but it didn't work forever, as you just heard in the story that we started with. But anyway, we come to the very last word, for today's episode, and this one is exploit, E-X-P-L-O-I-T, exploit. And by the way, we used it in the same context. We said, actually, the vilification of Rockefeller came mostly from the cattlemen who were afraid that the park service would not allow them free access to the valley grazing lands. The line 
was and still is drawn between conservation and exploitation. So these are two words. So obviously, these are kind of opposite. Now, of course, I, this is not the first time I say that, but you can always try to understand the words from the context, from the words before and after. That will help you a lot. Let's see if you can get it from the context. Now, exploitation can best be explained as what? As introduction or admission? As self-examination? As a series of kindly deeds? Or as using of a natural resource? Which one do you think is the right answer? Think about it, and I'll be right back. Now, for those of you who thought using of a natural resource, you're absolutely right. That's the closest meaning to exploitation. But I have more to say about exploitation because it's not just about using a natural resource. It's more about abusing a natural resource. Now, if you say that someone is exploiting a situation, you disapprove of them because they are using it to gain an advantage for themselves rather than trying to help other people or do what is right. So this word, based on the context, of course, can be used in a good way, but mostly we use it in a negative way. We use it to disapprove of the fact that this person or that person is exploiting a place, an area, or a situation. Now, for example, if you say that someone is exploiting you, you think that they are treating you unfairly by using your work or ideas and giving you very little in return. Maybe no credit at all, maybe no money, nothing. So... They're exploiting you. So as I told you, yes, it means that you're using a natural resource, but usually you'll have to think about it as abusing a natural resource more than just using the natural resource. And that was exactly what was happening in the valley. But anyway, that was our last word. Let me remind you again, we talked about 10 words today and 10 very good words that you can add to your active vocabulary bank. We started with the word aloof, revel, strife, annex, retrospect, defile, tumult, altruism, vilification, and finally, exploit. Remember that the best way you got to add these words to your active vocabulary bank is actually by practicing these words, not just by listening to the podcast. Now, listening to the podcast is great, and I hope that you're still with me. I hope you're still enjoying this episode. That's perfect, but if you really want to add these words to your active vocabulary bank, go to the website. The link is in the show notes. It will take you to the custom post I created for this episode, there you have everything you need. You have interactive exercises, you can do them on the website itself, or you have the PDF that you can download and practice not only the words that we learned in this episode, but there's also a section in the PDF where you can practice words we learned in the previous four Word Power episodes. Don't miss out on this opportunity to add these words to your active vocabulary bank. And with that being said, that'll be everything for today. I would like to thank you very much for listening to another episode, to another Word Power episode from English Plus Podcast. This is your host, Danny. I will see you next time.